We must move on to questions to the Minister of Finance and Personnel. And I have to tell members that question six has been withdrawn. And I call Mr. Samuel Gardner. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question number one. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. At the outset, I want to make clear that my answer is in respect of the Northern Ireland Civil Service. It is for other ministers to answer for the other public sector bodies that come within their areas of responsibility. The Northern Ireland Executive has asked my department to bring forward a range of proposals for strategic personnel interventions to effect a pay bill reduction in the civil service, including a voluntary exit scheme. It is important to stress that a voluntary exit scheme is only one of a range of measures to be considered. DFP, in close collaboration with other departments, has begun the process of establishing the overall size of the pay bill reduction that needs to be delivered and how this is to be achieved. It is uh, recognised that it will be important in the planning of these measures to take account of the civil service maintaining essential business continuity. At this early stage, it is, um, it is not possible to estimate the extent to which there might be any redeployment or, in, uh, or any need for retraining due to the implementation of a voluntary exit scheme. Mr. Gardner for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the, the Minister thus far. But, Minister, in my constituency, there are 13,400 people working in the civil service and public service. Will the Minister assure me that the interests of local towns like Lurgan, Portadown, and Banbridge are protected in any redundancy situations he develops? Sir. Deputy Speaker, I, I obviously have the, I have the responsibility um, as Minister responsible for personnel within the, the civil service and bringing forward a, a voluntary exit scheme for the civil service, one which I, I then hope that other ministers who are responsible for actually the bulk of, of public servants in Northern Ireland. The civil service only accounts for 15 per cent, roughly, of the total public sector in Northern Ireland, which is around 212,000 individuals. Um, and what we will do, uh, seek to do in that is to carefully, uh, we, we obviously, and the member of the House will appreciate the severest pressure we are facing is in terms of the need to reduce our pay bill so that we can live within our means, not just uh, next year, but also to be pre better prepared for, for future years. Um, and that will necessitate some, some tough choices, particularly around personnel issues. But I think everybody understands, uh, far from ideal as it is, that where you have less money and you're providing less services, then you need fewer people to do that. Um, and Whilst you know, one of the things that we will not consider, I'm sure, is, that is, is the impact on individual towns or parts of Northern Ireland, what we will be obviously ensuring is for, at the forefront of our minds in devising and implementing and executing a scheme is the interest of the people who live in those towns in terms of the services that they are receiving from government, and for whether it's a civil service or the broad public sector. Uh, and that's what we always have to remind, uh, keep the forefront of our minds that we are here to provide services to achieve outcomes for our citizens, and, whilst, and that, will, that will necessitate, obviously, public servants being situated not just in Belfast or in our major towns, but right across Northern Ireland. Um, um, we will ensure that anything that is done will not do any violence to the delivery of services, or as far as, far as it possibly can ensure uh, any violence to the delivery of services, whether that be in. Upper Ban or East London Dairy or Shankford or indeed any other constituency. Call Mr Ian McCree. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. The Minister will be, Minister will be aware that um, there have been references in local media that trade unions are planning to strike as a response to the job cuts or I suppose the um, voluntary exit scheme, maybe is the, the, the proper phrase for it. Would the Minister be willing to comment on what the impact of those strikes could be? Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, within actually 24 hours of the, the draft budget um, being announced um, earlier on in this month, I had already arranged a meeting with um, representatives of the trade unions. Uh, we had a very useful discussion, as, we, as you do on, on any occasion that we meet. Um, and what I heard at that meeting, uh, what I found at previous meetings before that, stands in stark contrast to some of the public utterances of some members of the trade union movement, who I don't think are representative of the trade union movement as a whole, or indeed uh, the members of trade unions. And to listen to some who, uh, with a degree of regularity, appear on our airwaves and on our television screens, um, there is an air of unreality about what they, they say in respect of this issue. I think that they fail to understand in the way that I think and I hope most of us in this House understand 
but I'm pretty sure the people of Northern Ireland, uh, the business community in Northern Ireland, understand that there is less money to do everything that we would want to do in Northern Ireland, uh, and that requires us to cut our cloth accordingly. So I would ask if, if those views are in any way seeping through to others within the trade union movement, Deputy Speaker, I would encourage uh, trade unions to reflect again on those sorts of comments. If indeed their objective or one of their objectives is to protect public services, then they have to ask the question of themselves, what would a strike or a series of strikes, or indeed as one member of the trade union movement said, a winter of discontent in Northern Ireland would actually achieve? And I'm all for them protesting, absolutely. But if they are going to protest, then they should protest where it, is, where it actually matters. And the fact that we have £1.5 billion less in spending power today isn't as a result of decisions taken by this executive. It is because of decisions taken by the Conservative-led coalition in Westminster. And if they want to protest, Deputy Speaker, that's the place to go. Well, Mr. Pat Ramsey. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And I thank the Minister for her response today. Minister, given the dependency in some areas, as the previous member, Samuel Gardner, had said on public sector jobs, particularly in my own constituency, the high relevance and, and low and high levels of, of economic activity, and given the, the, as a most emotive subject matter for many in our community, could the Minister outline to the House what discussions he has had with the trade union bodies in respect of these plans for early retirement and for redundancy packages? Well, Mr. Deputy Speaker, as I said in response to Mr. McRae, within, within a day of the draft budget being published, uh, I met with the trade unions and we had a very good discussion uh, in and around this issue. Um, and obviously, you wouldn't expect the trade unions to uh, welcome with open arms the draft budget, reducing in terms of public spending. And I think I've even said myself, you know, it's not a perfect draft budget. It, it does include tough choices and difficult decisions. Um, and obviously, they had comments to make in respect of a voluntary exit scheme and the reduction of the headcount uh, across the public sector. Um, but you know, I think by meeting with them very early on, I showed my intent in terms of the, you know, including them within the conversation. And obviously, at official level, um, there, there are and there have been and there will continue to be meetings between my officials uh, and indeed officials I would expect uh, elsewhere within the public sector and the system, and, uh, but primarily from my own department and the trade unions. And I think it's important that, particularly as we get to the, the stage, and I have a, I have a paper uh, to, away to the executive this week in terms of a reform and restructuring plan, which includes uh, details of a voluntary exit scheme. I hope to get approval for that. Uh, this Thursday from, from executive colleagues, because we need to start moving on this very, very quickly if we were to uh, realise savings in the next, starting in the next financial year. Um, but it's obviously it's important that at that stage, whenever that is up and running, that there is ongoing negotiation and discussion with the, or discussion with the trade union movement in terms of the terms of all of that uh, and how that works and what, what is in it. Because there will be, let's face it, Deputy Speaker, there will be many members of the public sector who do want to avail of a voluntary exit scheme, and the unions will, I'm sure, want to ensure that their interests are looked after in that process too. Call Mr. Chris Hazard. Call get last inquiry. Kesha Rado, let a whole question number two. Mr. Deputy Speaker, as Minister, it is my responsibility to ensure that I am content with all the output from my department, including briefing for the committee, and I will always endeavour to provide the information requested on a timely basis. Call Mr. Hazard for supplementary. Well, I'd like to I thank the Minister for, for his answer, uh, as short as it was, but no doubt the Minister will agree that uh, scrutiny of these plans and of these papers is very, very important. And in light of this, uh, does the Minister agree that public engagement and indeed community groups and trade unions' engagement in the consultation process of this draft budget is very, very important? Uh, yeah, well, uh, the, the drive for efficiency may even extend to my uh, answers in this chamber, although I wouldn't necessarily hold your, hold your breath. Um, I, I, yes, I do. I, mean, I think we are, we are we're not unique, but I think you know, our, our process of agreeing a draft budget, putting that out to public consultation, and then finalising that in, the, in a final budget, and then legislating on that, um, a process which is going to extend in Northern Ireland over a period of roughly five months, um, while well, it's not unique, um, is, I, I think stands in contrast to some other administrations who, you know, sometimes I envy the Chancellor's ability to get up at the budget and uh, budget day and say, this is the budget for next year, uh, and then the next day the legislation is uh, introduced and within a week it's the law. You know, there's a, there's a, a sort of a neatness to, to all of that, but it doesn't allow for, uh, in the way that we have, um, some, someone to be criticised the time that it takes, but I think it, it allows for healthy public debate. 
Um, obviously, this committee system, the committee system within this House, plays an important role uh, in terms of taking individual feedback from departments. Yeah, absolutely, and scrutinising what departments are saying, where they're going to make, in our case, of this draft budget reductions, but also allows them to engage with uh, sectoral groups, interest groups, uh, the community uh, who are affected by the decisions that are being taken by ministers. So, um, whilst it, it, it could, could be criticised as some as a bit of a, a cumbersome process, and, and, and perhaps there sometimes is a perception, particularly in an environment where we don't have as much money as we would like, perhaps it's seen by some as not maybe necessarily having a lot of change. But I, I think it, it, is, it is a useful process which allows the general public, allows trade unions, uh, allows the business community, allows others to have their say uh, and, and have an input into the budget. And I think that. Um, you will see that in the you will see that in the consultation. I'm sure we are already starting to see that in the consultation, and you will see that hopefully reflected in the final budget, which I hope to, to see agreed in early January. I call Mr. Phil Flanagan for question. Gorham, I've got the last question. Gorham, you cast over three. Question number three. Mr. Speaker, I have not had any direct communication with the Chancellor of the Exchequer on the content of his autumn statement. And whilst my officials are in ongoing contact with their uh, Treasury colleagues on a range of issues, they are not cited on the content of the autumn statement. Call Mr. Flanagan for supplementary. thank the minister for his answer. Mr. All the talk um, and the speculation about the, the statement here is all about uh, the transfer of powers and corporation tax. And the Financial Times says yes, and the Irish Times says no. But in, in, in wider terms, have you had any meaningful discussions, or have your um, officials have any meaningful discussions about the? The real term cuts to the block grant that you have alluded to in previous answers and how it has impacted and how it will impact on the executive's ability to deliver core frontline services in the next year? Mr. Mr. Speaker, as you, as you would expect in, in, uh, of myself in, in this role, that I take any opportunity to, to stress to um, Treasury ministers whenever I meet with them um, about the impact that uh, reductions in expenditure in Northern Ireland have, uh, or have had and are having. Um, I think it's wise it's fair to say that our 11 to 15 budget was challenging, certainly in the latter years, and we're experiencing that in this financial year. Um, that, has, that conversation has been perhaps slightly different to the conversation that we will be having now. Uh, I made a statement in the House earlier on today after having attended on behalf of the First Minister the British Irish Council meeting in the Isle of Man last Friday, uh, and it was an issue that was raised not just by uh, myself and the Deputy First Minister, but also uh, by the Scottish and the Welsh uh, administrations as well. Um, uh, now, that wasn't to Treasury officials, that was to the Secretary of State. Um, um, but there is there's no doubt that, Deputy Speaker, those, the impact of spending reductions is something that comes up in discussions that I have with Treasury ministers. It is something that comes up in discussions I have with other uh, government ministers. And indeed, it is something that is an ongoing part of, particularly the ramifications of it in terms of uh, how it affects public spending in Northern Ireland and ways that we can uh, deal with the issues that we have. It comes up in conversations that officials would have with tre their counterparts in Treasury too. Mr. Paul Gervin. Thank you, Minister, for his answer. I was just wondering, uh, in relation to the two billion uh, announcement by the Westminster Government, will Northern Ireland receive a Barnet consequential for this amount, and will it be ring fenced? Mr. Deputy Speaker, I thank the member for his question. Um, as was, was, I wasn't expecting um, a lot to come out of the autumn statement. Uh, hopefully, find out um, soon as exactly what the, the impact on Northern Ireland is. Um, I wasn't expecting, to be honest, a terrible lot to come out of uh, the autumn statement by way of Barnet consequences for Northern Ireland. Whenever you look at the fact that the, uh, the Chancellor is, is, has been, uh, certainly his government have been heading more towards. Uh, income tax reductions um, moving towards next year, uh, and have also been dealing with uh, less in terms of their own tax revenues. I didn't expect there to be a huge amount of additional spending. Um, so I was pleasantly surprised by the announcement at the weekend of uh, two billion pounds worth of an allocation to the NHS, which would have some Barnet consequences within it. You know, without the, it was interesting, interesting in timing. You would almost think that there was an election uh, in the offing. Um, however, um, we will take whatever we can get. And it does appear that there is at least between 40 and 50 million of a Barnet consequential for Northern Ireland as a result of the decision that the Chancellor is expected to make in his autumn statement tomorrow. And obviously, that is gratefully received by the executive and will uh, be a great help in terms of arriving at a final budget position. 
In respect of the final point that the member makes in terms of whether that is ring fenced, obviously that is a decision which is a, a matter for the executive to take in the fullness of the situation that we face. I am sure that, that my colleague, Mr. Mr. Wells, uh, the health minister, could make a compelling case as to why some or all of that money should go to his department. But I think we should bear in mind um, that there are a range of pressures. Uh, that are emerging between draft and final budget across a range of different departments, um, some of which I've spoken in this House about, some of which other ministers have come to this House and spoken about. And let's not forget either that the executive was generous to health in the settlement that we did have in the draft budget, which some other departments had to pay for with larger reductions, Deputy Speaker. So we were able to give it £150 million pounds of an additional allocation. It was one of only two departments that is actually in a beneficial position next year compared to last year. But obviously, they are, those, are, those pressures and what we have already done with the draft budget Mr. are factors Mr. that the executive Stephen. will consider. Mr. Stephen Agnew. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Could I ask the Minister, um, even if we do get a positive decision, as he would see it on, on corporation tax powers, will he listen to the likes of Bro McFerrin and Allstate and rein back his position about reducing it to 12.5% or even less? Mr. Deputy Speaker, I, I share the views of others, not least my, my colleague, the Enterprise Minister, who uh, answered questions in the House yesterday. Uh, I'm, I'm deep disappointed in the, the comments made by, by Bro McFerrin. Um, particularly his comments around the ability of the executive to take uh, decisions. Obviously, the executive has been able to take what Mr. McFerrin would consider to be positive decisions in respect of supporting his business and bringing employment into to Northern Ireland. Um, I think it is disappointing. Um, I think it is not actually, uh, aside from whatever, whatever the media may wish to do in terms of blowing up the, uh, the impact of what Mr. McFerrin said, his views are not reflective of the business community in Northern Ireland. And we have a rare occasion on the issue of corporation tax where not only are all of the five parties in the executive supportive of the devolution of corporation tax, but you have had a, uh, a collective across business, not just big business, say, represented by the likes of the CBI or the, the IOD or the Chamber of Commerce, but also small business in the shape of Federation of Small Businesses, the uh, Northern Ireland Independent Retail Trade Association or Pubs of Ulster, have all got behind a campaign to devolve corporation tax to Northern Ireland. And, and I, am, I remain hopeful of a positive decision tomorrow. Uh, the Economic Pact, which the First and Deputy First Minister agreed with the uh, Prime Minister in June of uh, last year, uh, made a commitment signed by the Prime Minister that they would make a final decision on the devolution of corporation tax no later than the 2014 autumn statement. The autumn statement is due tomorrow, uh, and we would expect a final decision tomorrow. And I am hopeful, given the robust and compelling case that Northern Ireland has made, not just in terms of rebalancing our economy and the need to rebalance our economy, but also the fact that we have a unique situation as the only part of the United Kingdom sharing a land border with a state with a significantly lower rate of corporation tax, I think that that compelling case stands on its merits, and I hope that we get a positive decision from the Chancellor tomorrow. Well, Mrs. Dolores uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Minister, there's been a, you did allude to uh, health in terms of the Barnet consequentials and uh, uh, some ring fencing perhaps for that, but uh, there's also, I understand, infrastructure also to be um, uh, accommodated within the budget uh, tomorrow in the autumn statement. I just wonder, in relation to the Barnet consequentials for Northern Ireland, whether or not there would be a willingness on your part and the part of the executive to ring fence some for infrastructure here. Well, it, it won't be a matter if there are Barnet consequentials from decisions that are taken across the water in terms of infrastructure investment. It won't be a matter of us ring fencing that for infrastructure. It will come as uh, as, as capital, which will have to be spent on on infrastructure, and that will be very welcome too, because whilst our capital position next year is improving from the previous year, it is still under pressure, uh, and, and any money that we can pour into developing our infrastructure on the one hand, yes, helps our economy, helps create jobs, but is also uh, a boost in terms of attracting investment to, to these shores. Um, so we will see what comes forward in the autumn statement in terms of any capital barnet consequences that there might be. Um, uh, some of the, the announcements that I have seen in recent times would appear to be the bundling together uh, and, in fact, re-announcement of some previous commitments made by the government. So it's not clear yet whether there are actually new decisions and, therefore, with the Barnet consequential, if there is comparability, or whether they're just a rehash of, of old announcements. But, again, um, a bit like the um, caution, too, on the, in terms of the, the announcement in respect of health it does look like there are po positive Barnet consequences coming from that. Um, it isn't clear where some of that might be financed, and that could be all coming from 
uh, decisions which have negative Barnet consequentials. And there, there may be other positive decisions, there may be some other negative decisions. So we'll, we'll find out uh, approximately this time tomorrow afternoon um, whether it is good news or, or, or not so good news for Northern Ireland. Call Mr. Peter Weir for a question. Uh, question number four, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the Northern Ireland Law Commission launched its consultation on the law of defamation on the 27th of November, and the consultation will run until the 20th of February of next year. I expect the Commission to try to complete the analysis of responses in the final report by the 31st of March 2015, which is a scheduled date for closure. And we are considering how the Commission's resources can be maximised to help it achieve that objective. However, if it is not able to do so, it may be possible to retain the services of the lawyer who is leading the project for a further short period to allow for the completion of the review. Uh, Mr. Thank the, the uh, Minister for his response. And obviously, we are talking about the, the Barnett formula. Obviously, with Lord Barnett recently deceased, he falls, seems to fall outside the law of defamation. But can I ask the, the Minister outline sort of contingency arrangements? Um, and can the Minister respond as to whether those contingency arrangements will in any way compromise the independence of the project? Mr. I thank the member for this question, and I thank him for, for his original question too, which gives an opportunity, I hope, to clear up for the House perhaps some confusion that may have um, emanated from the Minister of, of Justice's decision to end the work of the um, close down effectively the, the Law Commission from the end of this financial year. Um, and obviously, there was some concern I saw it in, in some uh, print media that this Deputy Speaker would lead to the, the end of this review, which I commissioned uh, about a year ago. Uh, and that we wouldn't see any progress on this matter. Um, I've had some discussions with him, or correspondence rather, with the Minister of Justice. Um, we've agreed in the fact that it has just been published this last week, the consultation, uh, and that will obviously take some time to, to complete and get the feedback on. And I was, I was always, in, in terms of the question that the member asked around independence, my whole objective in asking the Law Commission to carry out a piece of work reviewing the law of defamation in Northern Ireland and whether, in fact, there was a need to extend or extend in full or extend in part um, the changes that had been made to the law of defamation in England and Wales uh, to Northern Ireland was that we needed an independent perspective on it because we had had views expressed by some within the legal profession who may be considered to have a, a vested interest uh, and some from the uh, press and media who themselves might also be accused of having a particular vested interest in respect to this issue. I thought it was important to get an independent view. So, in short, the contingency arrangements that, that I am talking about are, are designed to advance rather than diminish the level of independence, and my department will, be, uh, will not be assuming any responsibility for the final stages of the review project, and rather it is envisaged that the Commission's lead lawyer, who has been carrying out this work up to date on our behalf, uh, will complete the final report uh, and then refer the report back to the department then for consideration. Oh, Mr. Alban McGuinness. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. But uh, the Minister misses the point in this. It's not really just uh, the fact that the report into defamation has been delayed and may not be fully completed. Uh, the fact is that the Law Commission is an outworking of the Criminal Justice Review an important outworking of the Criminal Justice Review. And at the stroke of the pen, the Minister for Justice has abolished or effectively, ab question, well, uh, effectively abolished the Commission. And is that not a terrible waste of resources which this Assembly could use in terms of building a good legislative body in this House? There's a pattern developing in terms of the lawyer asked the first question and the lawyer asking the Second question, and I of course would expect a lawyer to point out where I was, where I was wrong uh, in respect of this. I, I, I do think the, the decision in respect of the Law Commission is not a matter for me. Uh, it's a matter for the Minister of Justice, and the point that the, the member, has, uh, my learned friend, has made is, uh, uh, so eloquently would be better directed towards the Minister of Justice, who obviously faces um, not just this year, but in future years as well, pressures on his budget. And um, I'm sure he can argue the matter out with the Minister of Justice as to the relative merits of the Law Commission. But I think the, um, we're not wishing to speak for the Minister of Justice. I'm sure the Minister of Justice would highlight the fact that in the very pressurised budgetary environment that he is facing, not just this year but in future years, he has to take decisions which might, in an ordinary, uh, 
in a more perfect environment, a more benign environment, may not be decisions that he would want to take, but in order to ensure that as much of the front line in terms of services, particularly around the police, uh, are protected and supported within his budget area, within his area of responsibility, that the decision to do away with the Law Commission is in that context a reasonable decision to make. Well, Mr. Danny Kennan. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer so far. Um, so we've got the review, but when the consultation um, comes out, will the Minister assure us that if reform is needed, that he'll guarantee that we will bring forward legislation? Yeah, I, I, I was concerned, and um, that's why I'm glad to have the opportunity to clear some of this up. That the Commission uh, expiring at the end of the end of this year might have kiboshed the whole um, review, might have uh, shunted it into the sidelines, might have, been difficult for, might have been difficult for us to pick up and continue, might have been difficult to pick up and continue in a way that included the all-important independence that I wanted to have within that review. Um, I, can't, I would be foolhardy if I stood here and I guaranteed anything, uh, including legislation on this, but the whole purpose of the review is to get that independent perspective on this issue, for us to consider that. Uh, for us to see whether, where the balance of the arguments are in terms of the need to perhaps introduce legislation. Uh, and if, if the conclusion uh, that I reach after studying the report is that there is a need for legislation, I will seek to bring that forward. But obviously, towards the end of an Assembly term, there is a rush to get legislation through. There is a pressure on resources in terms of the legislative draftsman and, uh, and the time in this House and the time that committees might have. But certainly, if there is a need to do it, it is something that I will, uh, I will certainly pursue. Call Mr. Robin Swan. Question number five. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the DFP had no departmental role in the fact-finding investigation into the actions of Mr. Stephen Brimstone. Can I just ask the Minister to clarify what specific role then the head of corporate HR within his department had, who was tasked to carry out a fact-finding investigation into Mr. Brimstone's role as a civil servant? Mr. Deputy Speaker, the the member has um, articulated the position exceptionally well, to the point where I'm, I'm wondering why I even needed to ask the question. Um, the head of corporate HR in my department, corporate HR of course having a, a range of responsibilities, not just within my department but for the broad civil service as well, was asked by the permanent secretary responsible for the Department for Social Development to carry out a fact-finding mission. Uh, I presume that was on the basis of getting an independent view or voice from outside of the department. That work was carried out. It had nothing to do with me. I was not commissioning it. Uh, and therefore, it is not a responsibility for my department. Well, Mr. Jim Allister. Uh, Minister, Mr. Stephen Brimstone, because he's a special advisor, is a temporary civil servant. He's therefore subject to the same code of ethics as every other civil servant. Uh, and your department has responsibility for all civil servants in that regard. Why, therefore, would you not be interested in the fact-finding exercise pertaining to that, uh, which was carried out by your corporate HR department? And why do you want to be complicit in covering up the facts which were unearthed? Typical response, Mr. Deputy Speaker, from, from the member, who uh, has shown his position in respect to this whole issue by his his very open remarks that uh, in the committee where he is, he is I mean, particularly for, for a lawyer who I would have thought would have seen the, you know, waited to the balance of evidence was there, the gentleman has very clearly reached a conclusion in his own mind in respect uh, of this matter. Look, this was a fact-finding fact investigation commissioned by the permanent secretary responsible for the Department for Social Development. Nothing to do with me, nothing to do with my department. And I dare say, if I had have shown an interest in the report, asked for the report, wanted to see the report, the very member, Deputy Speaker, would have been accusing me of interfering in the process. I think what I have done in respect of not asking for the report, not looking at the report, not seeing the report, not commissioning it, not being involved in any way, shape or form, was the right and proper thing for me to do. Well, Mr Gregory Campbell. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I wonder, in his capacity as Minister for Personnel, could the uh, Minister outline what protection is offered to temporary civil servants who, when they do come before a committee uh, for an inquiry, which Mr Brimstone has done not once, not twice, not three times, but four times, and is due to come for a fifth time to answer questions when others decline to come, what protection is offered to civil servants like that from constant badgering from people who can't face up to the truth? 
Hi, Mr. Deputy Speaker. It wouldn't matter to me whether they were um, special advisers or indeed any other civil servant or public servant. I think before, when they come before committees of this House, they should be treated with courtesy and respect, and not treated as if they are one guilty, which is the behaviour of the, the member, Mr. Allister, in terms of his dealings uh, with Mr. Brimstone, uh, or that they are uh, they are being treated as if they are some sort of witness in a court of law where the, the member can practice the skills that he uh, developed down through the years in the high courts in, in Belfast. You know, I think all, all witnesses, all people who come to this House to give evidence in whatever way, shape or form should be treated with decency and respect. Order that ends the period for listed questions and we will now move on to topical questions and I call Mr Mickey Brady. Could I ask the Minister for his analysis of the Smith condition, uh, Commission recommendations and their potential local impact? Uh, I, I, I think it was uh, an, interesting, um, an interesting report that was published last week by the um, uh, Smith Commission, uh, one that I have taken a, a look of and will obviously study in much more depth. Um, interesting in and of itself in terms of the impact that it has on uh, Scotland, but more revealing too perhaps in the way that it means, particularly with the conversation that we are having at the minute in respect of the devolution of, of further powers to Northern Ireland. Obviously, we are very much focused, Deputy Speaker, on uh, the devolution of corporation tax and hopefully to get a, a positive response on that uh, in respect in, in the next 24 hours. But it does reveal, uh, particularly around welfare and indeed other uh, tax devolution that there, are, there is potential for Northern Ireland, should we want it, should we judge it to be in our, our interest. Uh, there is a potential for more powers to be granted to this Assembly, should we agree to the sequel. Mr. Brady for supplementary. Thank the Minister for his answer. Um, the Smith uh, Commission recommendations on welfare have changed the context of welfare cuts. Does the Minister think that the um, enhanced benefits offered to Scotland could have some impact or potential here? I think the, the area of welfare uh, that is contained within the Smith Commission is, is one of the more complex. Um, I think it, it, um, certainly I met with the new Scottish First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, last week at the British Irish Council. And, uh, she was at pains to point out that the Smith Commission, in her view, was a good start but didn't go far enough as far as Scotland was concerned. Uh, in respect of, of welfare, she was, I think, a, don't wish to ascribe views to her, but I think she was a little underwhelmed uh, that um, the powers that were, or the, the welfare benefits that were potentially going to be devolved to Scotland, were only a small chunk of the overall, uh, and would have to be uh, any decisions that came at a cost were going to have to be paid for uh, by the Scottish government. And that, of course, um, would. Uh, uh, sound familiar to us in this place because obviously we have negotiated flexibilities around welfare reform, uh, but all of those flexibilities obviously come at a cost uh, to the Northern Ireland uh, executive. Um, I think there are potential, there is potential rather, for us to work closely with Scotland as they. I mean, obviously they will tease this out and they will work this out themselves as to whether it's in their interest, whether they want to take it, how they want to take it, what they want to take, and what they don't want to take, and what the ramifications are in terms of developing an IT system for Scotland. And as they form a view in respect of all of that, I think it's, it's, it's important that we keep close to them, uh, continue to engage with them. That's something that the Deputy First Minister and I uh, pointed out to the, Deputy, or to the First Minister, and she was uh, keen for that to continue. Because there is a potential, I, I suppose, looking very much down the line, maybe four or five years, if the Scots do develop their own welfare system, and that is a system that is more in keeping with where we might want to be at that time, having passed some welfare reform legislation in the intervening period, there may be an opportunity for us to work with the Scots and have a joint welfare system which would help to reduce any administration costs. But I would be at pains to stress, Deputy Speaker, that's very much dependent on what the Scots decide uh, and is also something that is very much in the longer term. I don't see it happening in the next year to 18 months, which is what really whenever uh, well before that period we have to take a decision in regard to this issue. Mr. McGimsey for a topical question. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. And can I ask the Minister that, uh, bearing in mind we're looking at a workforce restructuring proposals, uh, what will the impact be? Does the Minister, uh, what is the initial view on the impact uh, on the, in terms of numbers of workers and numbers of jobs uh, actually impacted 
uh, and affected, bearing in mind the high levels of public sector workers within Northern Ireland? Yeah. Sir, Speaker, I think there is, there's been consensus across this House um, down through the years that certainly I've been here and before that too, that we have an over-reliance on the public sector in Northern Ireland for, certainly in the past, economic growth and, and for employment. Um, and we have a, a rather large public sector of 212, around 212,000 people for a population of just 1.8 million. Uh, and whilst we've want, wanted to rebalance it, perhaps the circumstances in which we find ourselves in, which is perhaps forcing us towards rebalance, aren't, balancing aren't ideal. Uh, it is too early, um, Deputy Speaker, to um, say precisely how many people we expect to, to lose across the public sector. Um, other than, but one thing I will say is that in discussions I've had so far with every minister, and they have come from every party represented within the executive, that there isn't a department which does not foresee the need to reduce its headcount. There isn't uh, an arm's length body or public sector body that doesn't itself then see the need to reduce the headcount by some degree or another. So this is something which all departments, no matter who is stewarding those departments in, in the ministerial sense, um, sees as anything other than necessary in order to help us to live within our means. Mr. Jimsey for supplementary. Uh, can I thank the Minister for uh, that answer? Uh, but can I say, obviously, if, if you're one of the 200,000 people uh, who are in the public sector, clearly there is uncertainty and anxiety and concern on these issues. And could he uh, therefore uh, uh, confirm to us that we are, uh, that his department and he as the Minister is in discussions with unions, with staff side, and that a key feature of any proposals coming forward will be voluntary redundancies rather than compulsory redundancies? Deputy Speaker, as, as the member was talking, I, I wrote one word down on a page and that was the word voluntary. I think it's important to stress that, uh, that this is a voluntary exit scheme that we are developing. And I, I think it is, uh, not to jump to rash conclusions, but certainly the feedback that, that I am receiving is that a voluntary exit scheme is not something that is going to be rebuffed by many within the public sector, that there are a, a number of people who would like to avail of a uh, voluntary exit scheme. And obviously, that we will see the quantity of that as we um, develop a scheme over the next number of, of months. Um, but I am aware that uh, it's one thing for me to stand here and say, uh, it's my responsibility to say that we have a budget and we must live within our means. And that requires, particularly in the circumstances that we're in, some drastic action. But I've also got to be sensitive to the fact that we are talking about people, and the member's right to, to make that point. And there are a great many people and a great number of families across Northern Ireland who will want to, for whatever reason, whatever their particular motivation is, whatever their particular concern is, will want to know with some degree of certainty what is happening and when it's happening and what it means for them. Um, so I don't want to, um, whilst I think I would be wrong to say that that something like this isn't going to happen, that we're not going to have to have a voluntary exit scheme. I think we very clearly are going to have to. It would equally be, be wrong of me to rush out and say it's going to be X number of people that are going to be in this department, that department, another department. There's a lot of work that has to be carried out before we hollow out exactly where we can take, one, how, many, how much money we have, what it's, going to, what it's going to cost to remove people, whether we're going to have to do that over one, two, three, or even maybe more years, and then to decide where they come from and when they're, they're coming out of those particular departments or arm's length bodies. So it's a complex piece of work, very, very technical piece of work, very difficult, very challenging piece of work, but we've always at all stages got to bear in mind that there are, there are people, these are people that we are talking about, and we need to be sensitive to, to their concerns. Call Mr Gregory Campbell for a topical question. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister outline uh, any consequences he believes that, there are, that he believes there are for Northern Ireland following the Smith Commission report? Yeah. I think there, there, are, um, there are perhaps no direct consequences flowing from the Smith Commission report. It was a discrete piece of work um, done for Scotland, uh, viewed from a Scotland perspective, populated by uh, Scottish po politicians and obviously with Scottish politics very much to the forefront of, of um, members in the, in, on that commission and the conclusions that they reached. Um, there have been some who have suggested that because um, there was no there was a, a rebuffing rather of corporation tax for Scotland, and then the subsequent comments of the, the first minister in Scotland that one she was disappointed, but also that um, 
she wanted to see, uh, and to be fair to her, she has been supportive of our call uh, for the devolution of corporation tax to Northern Ireland, uh, that that might have thrown some sort of spanner in the works because there was no, um, no decision or, or, or certainly a rebuffing of the Scottish demand for corporation tax. I don't see it that way, and I would be at pains to distress um, Mr Deputy Speaker, that Northern Ireland is in a uh, unique position. Um, we are not Scotland, both in terms of our economy and economic development. Scotland's economy is a much stronger economy than ours, much more industrialised than ours. Uh, we have suffered for a number of years, as the member of the House will know, from disinvestment or underinvestment because of the troubles. Uh, and we have that challenging land border issue with a state that has a considerably lower corporation tax rate. But you know, I am so I don't see I don't see that there, because there is nothing included within the Smith Commission about corporation tax, that it means that there is necessarily going to be a bad answer for Northern Ireland. And I hope that we get a, a, a positive outcome tomorrow in terms of at least uh, you know, some sort of decision um, by the, the Chancellor. And obviously, there will be a lot of work will be required after a decision, uh, a positive or supportive decision by the Chancellor will still necessitate work both at Westminster in terms of passing legislation there, also here in Northern Ireland, passing legislation here. Um, and, but I still am hopeful that we will get the, the go-ahead uh, tomorrow that will allow us to proceed with uh, securing that policy. Mr Campbell for supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, hopefully the Minister is right and there will be a positive response tomorrow, but as, assuming there is and within 24 hours we know the, the, the position, would he see the position post-legislation uh, at Westminster that his officials would then begin uh, a very diligent process uh, with the Treasury in terms of the outrolling of, of the positive response? Yeah, there's, there's, you know, I do, I expect, I do expect when we, the economic pact was very, very clear, Deputy Speaker, in terms of a final decision being made uh, no later than the autumn statement. So I expect a just statement tomorrow. I, not, I don't know what nature and shape that decision will take. Um, what that will say, what it will not say, but we expect a decision of some kind uh, tomorrow. And if it is, as we hope, a positive decision, then in many respects, after a decade of work to get to this point, the work then really starts uh, in terms of uh, ensuring that legislation can get through Westminster. And obviously, we're looking for to the member and his, his colleagues to ensure the swift passage of that legislation uh, across the Houses of Parliament. Um, but we have work here to do in Northern Ireland too in terms of uh, consenting to that legislation and also then at a later stage passing our own legislation, taking a decision as to where we want to set our level of corporation tax at. And there will be work again ongoing with officials. I mean, if, if, even if there is a positive decision tomorrow, it will not be a positive decision with a price, precise price and all of the technical details are. There will still be some work that will have to be carried out in regard to all of that. And that will obviously have to be done incredibly quickly over a short period of time. Um, but I do hope, like the member, that we get a positive decision tomorrow, which will allow Northern Ireland to, to move forward on this issue after a, a struggle uh, and a battle for the best part of a decade to get to this point. I think we have, we have done everything that we can, Deputy Speaker. I think we have made a very strong, very robust, very sound case based on evidence and based on need. And you know, I think we have a government in, in London who are receptive to the argument that we have made. Um, and I hope that they... Uh, follow through positively with a, a, a decision tomorrow which is beneficial to Northern Ireland. Mr David Hildage for a topical question. Thank you, yeah, Mr Deputy Speaker, and, and further to some of the previous questions and, and the theme there. Uh, most departments are reporting the, the need to reduce staff numbers next year if they are to meet their, their budget pressures and targets. Uh, main thing being, Minister, when, when will you expect uh, a voluntary access scheme to actually be in place? Mr Deputy Speaker, the member is right. Uh, I don't think there has been a minister who has um, reported to their committee um, about the impact that reductions in their budgets are going to have, who hasn't said that they, they expect to take uh, some number of staff um, off the payroll. Um, so, and certainly the feedback I'm getting in discussions that I've had with ministers so far is that every single one of them has wanted to discuss this issue, has wanted to understand uh, when a scheme will come forward. because. They are not relying or not hugely relying on making savings next year, but they want to know that they can start to make savings next year, which will be actually materialising in much larger quantities the year after. Um, I have submitted, Deputy Speaker, a paper to the Executive, which is a broader paper on restructuring and reforming the public sector, uh, which includes a range of, of issues, but primarily includes this issue of a voluntary exit scheme. And the paper outlines the, the, the hope that, with a, a lot of effort and a lot of work being put in, in the coming weeks and months that we could have a, 
uh, voluntary exit scheme in place, open for applications early on in the next financial year. Uh, we're then starting to take uh, our first tranche of people out of the public sector around about August, September time of next year. Ordered. I'm afraid time is up.